Presented by Caltech. Our next speaker is Professor Michelle Efros, who is the George Van Ostel Professor of Electrical Engineering. Her primary research interests include information theory for communication networks, particularly in developing tools to understand large networks thus far impenetrable to information theoretic techniques. Professor Efros has received numerous awards and fellowships, and an abbreviated list includes the NSF Career Awards, the Charles Lee Power Foundation Award, the Richard Feynman Hughes Fellowship, an Okawa Research Grant, and a citation as one of the world's top young innovators. She is a fellow of IEEE and served as president of the IEEE Information Theory Society in 2015 and has served on a large number of committees and advisory boards, including the SIS Directorate at the National Science Foundation and the TAB Strategic Planning Committee for IEEE. Her innovative work is about understanding the human brain. Human memory results from complex interactions between the tens of billions of neurons in our brains. Understanding these interactions requires not just an understanding of the functions of the individual neurons, but also the network of connections through which they interact. This project seeks to understand whether the mathematical tools used to build and analyze massive technical communication networks, such as cell phone networks and the internet, can lend insight into how our brains write, store, and retrieve memories. Professor. Professor. So thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you so much to all of you who have supported this fund. I think it's really an incredible thing. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how that uh, fund has benefited my lab and the kinds of questions we're interested in. So my recent interest, uh, recently developed interest, is in memory. I'm interested in how the brain, our brains, store memories create memories, retrieve memories. And these very basic questions will uh, be the topic that I'll tell you about today and are the topic of the grant that we got under this program. The motivation for studying memory, there are lots of possible reasons that you might be interested. I, I think category one speaks about one of the most fundamental processes that underlies everything we are and everything we do. So if you don't have memory, vision becomes impossible. How in the world will you interpret what you see if you don't have a way to reference back to things that you've learned previously? Likewise, language, both acquisition and using language, understanding language, none of those things are possible if you don't have a storage system where you can store past information about what these words mean um, and how these words put together communicate a thought or idea. Thought is impossible without memory. It's a process of taking one idea and building to another idea without m remembering what the first step was. I think we wouldn't get very far. Our beliefs, our very identity, I would argue, is very much reliant on our memory. If we think about who we are, we think about past experiences, maybe data about ourselves, all of those things rely on having memory. These, this is one possible motivation. It's just a basic fundamental process, uh, memory, and we'd like to understand it. Another reason that you might be interested in understanding memory is so that you can have a better hope of combating when memory goes wrong. And when memory goes wrong, we tend to think of things like Alzheimer's disease, uh, dementia, amnesia, places where you lose the ability to either create or access or store memory. Actually, memory can go wrong in two ways. The one that you think of most is the case where you lose that ability to access and store information. Uh, the other is actually the opposite. It's the case where you can't turn off memory or memory is too strong. Things like PTSD, depression, hallucination, cases where memory is overwhelming, 
where memory is irrepressible, where memory is indistinguishable from what's happening right now, where you can't tell whether you're remembering or pulling something out of past experiences or whether you are actually experiencing that now. Maybe understanding memory would help us combat these two kinds of ways that things can go wrong when uh, you have trouble with your memory. Another thing that might motivate an interest in studying memory is technological inspiration. Our memory systems do things that none of the machines that we can create today can do. Our ability to connect ideas to each other, our ability to pull up some information with a tiny cue, you know, the smell of your grandmother's apple pie, can bring back all kinds of memories. We don't have systems that can do those kinds of associations for us. And so maybe understanding memory is a way to technological innovation. I have to say my personal motivation for studying memory is, is not really these things, although these things are great too. For me, the inspiration is this last one. Memory systems are fascinating. They're just incredible and interesting. And the more you learn about them, the more incredible they seem. It's not one of those things where you look at it, it's like, oh, that was easy. You know, now that I understand it, the magic is gone. Memory, at least for me, has that fascination. And that is my personal motivation right now for studying memory. As I mentioned, there are many basic questions that you can think about when you study memory, and our time is short, and so I will focus on just one of them, which is on the question of recall. So you have a memory, and you'd like to pull that memory up again. That's the question that I'll focus on and tell you just a little bit about the kinds of things that we've been thinking about to try to understand the recall of memory. Now, the first thing you might do, and the first thing I did when I got really interested in memory is go off and look at the literature. And I have to say there's a vast literature about neuroscience in general and memory in particular. And I took this picture of just a few of the books currently in my office to give you a feeling for that. I have to say that this picture did not capture sort of the magnitude that this collection of literature um, has in my life right now. And so I sketched myself in just so you can <laughs> get some sort of concept of scale. <coughs> the other way I wanted to give you a little bit of a feeling of what this literature is like and what this field is like as a research community is to tell you about this book here. So this is a book called Principles of Neural Science, and it's the textbook used in the Introduction to Neuroscience class, which my colleagues here at Caltech were generous enough to allow me to sit in on. This is the textbook. I have to say, when I went to the library to pick it up and reached up to that top shelf where this book happened to be sitting and tried to tip this large, heavy book and get it down off that shelf without giving myself a concussion, I thought about the irony uh, of the relationship between neuroscience and possible brain injury <laughs> through this textbook. <laughs> but I managed to get it down safely. And I think that it's somehow emblematic of what research is like in the field of neuroscience to look back at the history of this textbook just momentarily. So the first edition of this textbook was written in 19, or published in 1981. It was 468 pages. A few years later, it was roughly twice that size. And if you look at the editions that have come since, we're now on edition five, which by the way weighs 8.8 .8 pounds according to Amazon shipping information. Um, <laughs> you can see that this is a field of very active research. People are working very, very hard. There are at least tens of thousands of neuroscientists in the world from what I could tell from looking on the web. And they are making progress at a rate which looks about linear at this point. Every 14 days, a new page of incredibly dense technical material is added to this book, <laughs> on average. Now, what is the nature of that material, and why would a field that is moving so quickly need someone like me? So I think that the best way for someone like me, an electrical engineer, to understand the difficulty of the field of neuroscience is to imagine approaching our own technology using their processes. So if you want to think about what it's like to be a neuroscience researcher, imagine taking a computer that you know nothing about how it works and none of the abstractions with which it was built, and sawing a little hole into the case that contains it, and putting in a few probes, and then trying to reverse engineer assembly language. 
That's sort of what, like, what neuroscience research is like. These are the tools that they have available, and they are trying to understand the neuroscience code, the code that implements things like memory, using those probes that they've put in through those holes and with which they take measurements. And they're incredibly ingenious in how they do that. But you can imagine what the assembly language textbook would look like if that's how you had to learn how assembly language works. And I would argue that that's a little bit like, a little bit like what this textbook looks like. I would argue further that there's room for more theory in this community. And maybe that's something that we can offer. Maybe the mathematical tools that we have used to study other systems, other complicated systems, can also be used to study a complicated world such as the world of neuroscience. And I would argue further that if we're successful at this, the book should actually get smaller over time rather than larger. That by putting the right theory on top, by uh, adopting the right abstractions, that maybe we can get progress that doesn't involve a growth at this kind of rate. All right, now that brings me to the challenge. My personal field is a field called information theory. And I think information theory has something to offer in understanding memory in our brains. But I'm not a neuroscientist. And if you're a funding agency, this might be something you would notice. The other thing you might notice is, you know, lots of other people are, you know. If you have to decide where to give your money and you sort of have these two possibilities, um, it's pretty clear where you might put your money, which I think is one of the incredible things about the Carver Me uh, New Adventures Fund. I mean, the opportunity to take such a vast, ambitious, but certainly risky kind of approach, a risky question to take on, a field that has so much background and a very steep learning curve. The idea of investing in something like that is really incredible and I think quite unique to a place like Caltech. I'm not sure you could find people somewhere else who would say, yeah, she's an electrical engineer. Let's give her some money to study neuroscience. And I, I really am incredibly grateful for that. I think it's an <coughs> amazing opportunity. So I told you that I thought information theory might be helpful here. And so let me say just a couple of words about what information theory is. So information theory is a field that was developed with a single paper in 1948. That's where the field started, with one paper. And I would argue that that one paper is more responsible for the information revolution than any other single piece of uh, research that you can point to. In that paper, the questions that were studied were storage of information, and transmission of information in technological systems. And in particular, the first paper came with this picture. Uh, this is a picture out of Claude Shannon's paper from 1948. It includes a single transmitter of information, a single receiver of information, and we're trying to communicate information reliably and efficiently in this system. Um, while for many years the field focused primarily on systems with a small number of communicators, in this case two, my own personal research uh, focuses largely on how do you take these tools that were developed for small networks and generalize them up, learn how to generalize to very, very large networks. And with this in mind, I imagine that you think you know where I'm going with this talk. You think what I'm going to say is that therefore, because I understand something about these large systems, I'm going to take a human brain and model it as a collection of wireless communicators and then try to analyze things like the capacity of these networks. And I'd have to say, you know, if I took this approach, I'd be in very good company. The allure of using analogies of things you know to try and understand new things that you don't know is one that people have uh, felt for literally centuries. So Plato, for example, wrote about memory and thought of it as like putting a, a stamp into wax. He talked about recall as like pulling a bird out of an aviary, that sometimes you get what you want and sometimes you get something else. And, and this was his way of thinking about information storage and information retrieval. 
So there are many people who have used this strategy, and it's a great strategy. It's a strategy that we use to understand all kinds of new things, but it's not the strategy that I would argue Shannon used in his 1948 paper, and it's not the inspiration for what I want to do today. So this will not be my model, although some days when I stare at my cell phone too much, you know, it, it doesn't seem so far-fetched. <laughs> So what instead is the plan of action? Well, I'd like to begin where information theory began, not where it end, ends, or not where it is today. That is, I don't want to take the answers to some other question and apply them to this question. I want to take the strategy that helped Shannon crack the information problem and apply that strategy to this new problem. And that strategy I'd summarize in three steps. So the first question is, choose a system model. And there are two things you need to worry about when you choose a sim system model. It better be really, really simple. Because that's where the hope of analyzing it will come from. You can add complexities back in later, but, but come up with the barest essence of a model to start. So choose a system model as step one. Then define memory. And define memory not in what you think that system model can do, but really try and think about what memory means and capture it in the language of that system model. And the third thing will be see, see what you can do. You know, can your definitions, can you say anything about how the definition of memory works if the system model is really the model of our brain? All right, to come up with a system model, we need to know something about the brain. And here are just three tidbits of information from those very large books about how the brain works. So the brain is estimated, human brains are estimated to have about 100 billion neurons. And by adulthood, we, we are estimated to have 100 to 500 trillion synapses. Synapses are the little gaps between neurons. So neurons have these axons. They use these axons to send out signals. And those signals go across these little gaps, which are the synapses, to the, mostly to the dendrites of other neurons in some very large and complicated uh, network. When you're children, you have many more synapses. So three-year-olds are estimated to have a quadrillion neurons. But as you get older, you sort of pair away them. You get rid of extraneous connections. And the learning process um, has some association with this pairing process. And at adulthood, uh, 100 to 500 trillion is the estimate that I've read. Um, each neuron's operation is typically modeled with some sort of an integrate and fire model. So the idea is you're, if you're a neuron, you're gathering information that's coming at you from other neurons. Some of those, that information is excitatory and some is inhibitory and you get some general sense of the room, the sense of the environment. And if in overall you get the excitor, excitatory uh, impression, then the neuron fires and sends its signal down to the next collection of neurons, all of whom are doing the same process simultaneously. Now, as I said, we'd like a model for this system, and it better be really simple. So the model that I'm going to propose to you today is a simple Markov chain model. The idea of a Markov chain, for those of you who haven't seen it or haven't seen it recently, is a Markov chain embodies the idea that the influence of the past on the future is entirely encapsulated in the present. So the past does affect the future, but only in ways that are in the state of the present right now. It doesn't have any way of reaching over the present and influencing the future. That's roughly how a Markov model works. And the second thing you need to know about, or, or the thing that you need to know about a Markov model is that the behavior of a Markov model is captured in something that we'll call a, a transition law. And the transition law just tells you how does the next, what is the behavior at the next step likely to be given the present. All we need to know in this model is the present because of this property. Anything about the past that's going to influence what's about to happen is encapsulated in that present state. All right, let's make this a little bit more concrete to make it easier to follow. So let's consider just this tiny network. As an example, we have two neurons that are gathering information from the outside world. Maybe these are in the retina of your eye, and they are uh, synapsing upon a third neuron here. And so we have this three-neuron model. We'll represent whether this neuron fires or not in any small window at, of time by a 0 or a 1. So a 0 means it didn't fire and a one means it did. 
We'll give each of these a unique position. I'll call this neuron 1, neuron 2, and neuron 3. And we'll represent the state of the network in any particular uh, step of time by this triple that says which of those three neurons fired or didn't fire in, in that particular step in time. So 0, 0, 0 means none of them fired. 1, 1, 1 means that they all fired during that window. And 0, 1, 0 means only the second neuron of these three in this example fired. It's a simple representation for the sake of illustration. I'll make the assumption that the time window in which we're looking is so small that if what happens now is going to influence the future, it'll influence the next step rather than the current step. So we'll choose these time windows very small so that we can look at cause and effect in a piecewise form over time. Now, I mentioned that we're going to have a transition law. And don't worry, I won't tell you about each of these numbers. Um, but the transition law is just telling you what is the probability that the state at time n plus 1 will take on each of its possible values when you know what the state was at time n. And the choice of those values will be influenced by three things. Uh, it will come from knowing the input distribution, that is knowing how likely firing and not firing is at these neurons that weren't influenced by other neurons, but instead by outside information, such as light coming in on your eye. It'll be influenced by the network topology, that is knowing what happened in the neurons that are firing upon you will influence what's likely to happen in a particular neuron at a given instant in time. And finally, it'll rely on the neuron model, that is this uh, integrate and fire kind of model, whatever model you're using for how likely a neuron is to fire in a given time step, given whatever the previous neurons did uh, in that time step. All right, so this is step one. This is the simple model that we've come up with for what does a brain look like and what does its behavior look like over time. The second thing we need, as I noticed, is a notion of memory. And again, we don't want to pick our notion of memory to match what we think will work well with these Markov models. We just want to try and capture what we really think of as memory. Now, memory has many different meanings. And the neuroscientists actually break memory down into a bunch of different categories. But let me just tell you in a very simple way what I mean here when I talk about memory. So first, we're going to think about problems that are defined by a fixed stimulus and a desired response. So as an example, imagine that you pull up an old yearbook or, or pull out an old photo album, and you see a picture of some kid that you knew back in elementary school. And you ask yourself the question, what was that kid's name? That's a question about the kind of memory that we want to talk about here. Um, there is a right answer. And I will count you as succeeding in the memory task if eventually you come up with the answer. That doesn't mean you have to come up with it in some short time window. It means even if you think about it at you know, in the middle of the night, you wake up and oh, I know it. I remember that kid's name. That will count as success in this memory model. How do we take that intuition and turn it into something that we can deal with mathematically? We need a model that speaks the same language as the system model that we defined previously. And here's the model. We'll imagine that the stimulus is some distribution, I called it P, on the set, uh, on a collection of input neurons. These are co the collection of neurons that are collecting information from the outside world. If you set up some distribution on those neurons and fix it, that will be what we use to represent our stimulus. <clears throat> In terms of the response, we'll imagine some output collection of neurons. And we are hoping to create a distribution Q on those output neurons. If you could do the experiment, you would imagine thinking of this child's name over and over again, thinking about them in all kinds of different situations, because lots of your neurons are doing things that have nothing to do with me this memory task. Some of them may be digesting your lunch. Some of them are helping you breathe. You'd like to separate out the neurons that are specifically working on this task or most relevant to this task and look at what they're doing now. And for the purposes of this simple exercise, we'll imagine that we just know those. And we know the distribution of what their behavior looks like when you're actually remembering this child's name. That will be the distribution that we'll call Q. What does our memory model look like? Well, if you imagine setting the input distribution to this P for all time n, 
And then you look at the distribution on the outputs of this network, these, this collection of neurons that are the ones that are active when you succeed at this task. If that distribution approaches Q as n goes to infinity, that is, if eventually you converge on this solution, we will say that you have succeeded mathematically in this memory task. Again, just to represent this simply, I've drawn out an example. It's just a cartoon. It doesn't contain real data. We're imagining here a network of 25 neurons and saying what they did at each step in time. We've chosen some collection of them that represent the inputs to this network, some other collection that represent the relevant outputs to this task. And we're just asking if we set the distribution on the inputs to be P, does the distribution on the outputs approach this desired value Q associated with this particular memory task? So here are some questions to consider. The first question that we should ask is, can our system model, which was step one, exhibit the behavior we call memory, which was step two? That is, can this Markov model even do this thing that we call memory? We came up with these things without worrying about whether they match. They were just trying to capture the basic uh, properties that we associate with these different phenomena. Can they exhibit the performance that we want? Um, you might also ask what kind of memories and how many different memories you can store. How does the organization of the neurons in your brain affect what you can and cannot uh, remember, and so on. Now, I'm running out of time, so I will make it uh, really quick. We, we use a variety of different lessons from the mathematics, many of the same lessons, in fact, from information theory, to try to get at these questions. Uh, the first lesson is probably the most basic lesson of information theory, which is that random events actually are easier to predict when you have more of them. It's counterintuitive, perhaps, uh, but the more random events you're trying to predict, actually the better we get at predicting them. And so the vast size and the speed of the processing in our brain are actually a benefit from the perspective of understanding memory. Um, to give you some ideas to the kinds of results that we have so far, we've been able to show that, in fact, these Markov models, these very simple models of the brain, actually do exhibit the property of memory. And the key to that observation is the fact that the input distribution that we're using changes the transition law, that we're observing a kind of stochastic stability that allows you to get to different states when you have different input distributions. And therefore, this notion of recall is actually something that comes out naturally of these very, very simple models. Um, there are more questions, and, and I'm happy to talk with people more on uh, more one-on-one -on -one afterwards. But in the interest of time, uh, I'll, I'll just leave this up for a second so people can see. There are a variety of other questions that we're interested in, um, but I will uh, keep going for the interest of getting us uh, on to the schedule uh, or to the break on time. So to conclude, what we've been able to show is that the complex phenomenon of remembering arises even in the simplest model of a network. And I have to say, you know, people have tried to use tools from information theory and other theoretical constructs in neuroscience before. Um, often they, they map the solution to a model. Um, I don't know many examples where you come up with a model and see that the solution arises naturally from it. So um, this is one of the things that we've managed to demonstrate. Further exploration is certainly needed. We're in the very earliest steps of this process uh, to really understand all of the processes that go into memory and learning and uh, retrieval. The end goal of all of this is a new uh, neural information theory. And the hope is that if we can develop such a neural information theory over time, maybe we can help the neuroscientists shrink some of those textbooks. The last thing I'll do is just to put up this list of thank yous that I uh, owe for the opportunity to do this research and, and hopefully the opportunity to continue uh, in this project that I'm really excited about. The first is a thank you to the Carver Mead New Adventure Fund. Um, the funds that, that we received through this grant got us started and uh, that was really invaluable to this process. We've since gotten a little bit of money also from the Chen Center to help continue the research, and I hope that it will continue for some time to come. I owe thanks also to some of my colleagues, Ralph Adolf, Henry Lester, and Marcus Meister for uh, allowing me to sit in on all their classes, which is uh, really helpful in this deep learning curve. And to, Sh to Shaheen Lael, who was the student funded by the term 
uh, of support that we got under this grant and helped with the initial research uh, and literature search. And special thanks goes to Carver Mead, who is here. Um, thank you both for your inspiration and for your kindness in really encouraging me in this uh, difficult and very new adventure and for all of the time and uh, conversations that have been really helpful to the process. So thank you so much and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, questions. Yes, please. <laughs> In a single bound. <laughs> well, thanks. Fascinating. A uh, couple of very quick questions. So one is, in your mathematical setup, do you have to know the full distribution, or is the, the way the memory works is just a couple of the moments? And maybe this is related to my second question. What about, you know, wrong recall? Like we rewrite our memories, right? Yeah. So are these related? Yeah. Thank you. So. To your first question, um, the kinds of models that we have for our transition laws are very simple, and they will converge to something. Um, so these kinds of Markov processes have certain stochastic convergence properties, and those are a good guess as to you know, if you are succeeding in this memory task, what is that distribution to which you're converging? So there is some back and forth between either knowing in advance and using it to decide whether you are successful at memory or deciding what being successful at memory looks like if you were to look in the brain. What should that pattern be like? Understanding these very simple transition laws can give you good guesses as to what those answers should be that you can compare experimentally. So that was the first question or at least uh, a thought about your first question. In terms of your second question, the models that we're looking at here allow you to change the input distribution, but they're not incorporating any notion of plasticity. So in this sim simple example, I am using just the input distribution, the network of connections, and the model of the neurons to come up with that transition law. I don't have included in the examples or, or the high-level picture that I gave today an a second step, which is how does plasticity happen? That is, how do the strengths and connectivity inside your brain change as you actually acquire new memories? Um, the process through which that happens is the same process through which you do recall. That is, when you are using your brain, it is constantly changing whether you're trying to pull up an old memory or acquire a new memory. Changes are happening both ways because you're using this system of neurons and the use of the system itself changes the network. Because of that, retrieval of information can actually change the memories that you are retrieving. And I think that these models can incorporate that. They require just one more step into what this transition looks like, transition law looks like, which is that it shouldn't only include the three factors that we've represented so far, but should include this additional notion of plasticity. The kinds of rules that people use um, to think about plasticity are things like the Hebbian model, which basically says neurons that fire together wire together, meaning that the strength of the connections of neurons that are simultaneously used grows over time. Those kinds of things can be represented in these systems and will help us to understand acquiring new memory and how retrieval affects the actual memory that you have stored. Another question? Please. Great talk. Uh, whenever we have a model, we try to throw things against it to see whether it will be explanative. I had just a thought. I, this is not my area. I apologize. But I wonder if you could do an asymptotic analysis. We have some idea of the capacity of the brain, right? And you mentioned that initially. We also have and the, the, some idea of how many neurons and, 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 and axioms there are connecting them. So what I wonder is, is there a way of taking your model and seeing whether something with whatever number of neurons and connections could actually store what we think a human brain yeah. could store. That might be a way of testing your model. Right. Yeah, people have done studies like this. Um, and they have some early ways as to testing, you know, does your model sort of indicate a capacity that you think is appropriate for how much our brains can store? Um, I personally haven't worked on this idea, but I, I do think that it, it's an interesting one. I think you have to be a little bit careful with the notion of capacity itself, um, because capacity, at least as an information, thinks about it. 
is a, a concept that comes out of a system where we have separated efficient information storage from reliable transmission. This separation principle, Shannon proved to be optimal in a technological sense, um, but it, it has no natural analog in, in, a, in a brain. So I, I don't think that there are error correction codes in our brain. I don't, well, or at least not pure, you know, they're, they're somehow, it's all being done together. So I, I do think that the idea of understanding how much systems like this can store is a very useful question, but I don't think it will involve computing the kinds of capacity that we compute, at least in the information theory world, we'll need new notions of capacity. And I think that hopefully this will help us figure out what those new notions should be. Thank you. One last question. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.